Honorable Chief Minister, Honorable Ministers, Honorable Members of Legislative Assembly, Honorable Chairman, Odisha Skill Development Authority, esteemed Chief Advisor to Honorable Chief Minister, esteemed Chief Secretary, additional Chief Secretaries, Principal Secretaries, Secretaries of different departments, senior officers of the state government, collectors of the district and district level officers who are joining us through video link, and distinguished guests, eminent persons in the field of academics, art, culture, literature, and music present today. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome all of you to this 25th Odisha Knowledge Hub Lecture. We have with us today Dr. Ricky G. Cage, a two times Grammy Award winner, Indian music composer and environmentalist to deliver the 25th Odisha Knowledge Hub Lecture. I welcome you, Dr. Cage, to Odisha and to our beautiful capital city, Bhuneshwar, which is also known as the Temple City of India. Odisha Knowledge Hub Lecture Series is a platform created for listening interacting and engaging with eminent persons and experts on a range of subjects relevant to the society. Through these lectures, senior civil servants and development administrators, important civil society dignitaries, and young students get an opportunity to interact with eminent persons and enlighten them on different subject matters. The first OKH lecture was delivered on 22nd January 2016. Since then, several eminent speakers from within and outside India have graced this forum. And in all these lectures, the participants have been in our Honorable Chief Minister, Honorable Ministers, Honorable MLAs, distinguished civil society members, senior officials of the government, from Chief Secretary to Secretaries and Directors and subordinate officers, district magistrates and other district level officers. Interested students also do participate in these events. The COVID-19 pandemic had disrupted the lecture series. Today, we are happy to resume the lecture series in physical mode. I don't think there could have been a better way to reboot it than having Dr. Ricky Cage with us. The past two years have taught us that the technological advancements pale into insignificance in the face of nature's might. The lessons learned from the pandemic years have prompted us to live in harmony with nature. Dr. Kez's works over the years are aimed at a world in which life, all life can live sustainably and in harmony. Dr. Kez has used his talent to better our planet through his music, advocacy, lifestyle, and action. In addition to serving as an ambassador for various UN agencies, in the year 2018, Dr. Cage released My Earth Songs, which is a collection of 27 songs based on the 17 SDG goals, with an aim to create awareness and to inspire the younger generation to make a positive impact on their lives as well as lives of people around them. Interestingly, one of the major pillars of the state government's development agenda is to ensure that the developments take place in a sustainable manner with least adverse impacts on the planet. The state government is committed to achieving the SDG 2030 agenda and to further translate the SDG to 2030 goals and targets into positive outcomes. Under the visionary leadership of our Honorable Chief Minister, the state is committed to leaving no one behind as it moves forward in scripting its development journey for the future. With these words, I welcome you, Dr. Cage, and leave the floor to you to share your thoughts on my art songs with the August audience. Over to you. Namaskar, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute, absolute honor for me to be over here in this beautiful city and, of course, this amazing hall. Never seen anything like this anywhere else. Uh, a big round of applause to all of you. <laughs> and uh, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Ricky. I'm a musician. I'm an environmentalist two pillars that have pretty much dictated my whole life and all of my life decisions. And, uh, you know, and uh, 
the only kind of music that I make is about the environment and sustainability. I do not do pop music, I do not do Bollywood music, film music. Every single piece of music that I make is about the environment and about positive social impact. Uh, thank you so much. So, <clears throat> ever since I remember as a child, I've always been two things. I've been a musician and an environmentalist. So music, the musician side of it has always been that, you know, for me, my ears were always more important than my eyes. You know, while my classmates in school were very fascinated by television and by, uh, you know, by uh, uh, cartoons and video games, uh, for me, the center of my universe was my music system. So I would listen to music all day long during those days, cassette tapes and records and LPs. I used to listen to music all day long, try to understand uh, the different musicians that are performing this music, try to understand the songs, try to understand the different cultures that each and every musical instrument comes from. So a lot of my uh, education has happened through just listening to various forms of music from all over the world. And it was through music that I found a very deep connect with nature. Uh, so, I actually was born in America, I was born in North Carolina and uh, it was sort of like in the middle of nowhere, a lot of wooded areas around my home. I was there for about the first eight years of my life, a lot of wooded areas around my home, a lot of forest areas and we would have a lot of these so-called creepy crawly animals that would enter our home on a regular basis. You know, animals like snakes and lizards and reptiles and amphibians, frogs, rats, they would enter our home. And my teachers and my parents used to tell me that, or rather used to warn me, that as soon as you see any of those animals, immediately step on them and kill them. Or, you know, or just run away from them. And my question to them always used to be that, if we're just supposed to kill them the minute we see them, then why do they exist on our planet, you know? Why do they exist? They obviously have some sort of purpose. And of course, when I grew much older, I realized that every single species of animal, no matter how seemingly insignificant or seemingly small they are, are very important uh, for the ecosystem and very important for the planet. And it's this uh, delicate balance of the ecosystem that keeps all of us human beings alive. And that's what I understood later on. But these were the questions that would keep me awake all night. And that is how, even before I knew the meaning of what is an environmentalist, I was an environmentalist and a lover of nature. And then, of course, if you look at music itself, how did music start? You know, music started off as sounds from nature. You know, sounds of the birds, sounds of the trees, sounds of the wind, sounds of the animals, sounds of the river flowing, sounds of the raindrops. And then slowly, we human beings started imitating those sounds and making them more pleasing to our ear. And then later on, we started pulling out objects from within nature, like, you know, a bamboo flute, or a box of seeds, or two stones, or percussion through, uh, cre creating percussion instruments through animal skin and animal hide. So, uh, it's only for the last maybe 1,000 years that music has actually become academic with notes and scales and rags. But if you look at indigenous populations anywhere in the world and even in our own country, they still sing about nature, they still use animal sounds in depicting their music. So music and uh, nature is basically one and the same and that's how I have made it in my career. Now, push a little bit forward and uh, in, uh, uh, you know, all of us know that it's in our 12th grade, in our 12th standard, that all of us have to make a very strong decision as to what we want to do for the rest of our lives. Am I right? So in our 12th standard, we have to decide whether we want to become a doctor or an engineer or an MBA or whatever you want to do uh, for the rest of your life. And I had made a very strong decision and there were no two thoughts in my mind that I was going to become a musician for the rest of my life. I wanted music to be my hobby, my profession, my bread and butter, and I wanted to do music till the day I die. And I went to my father. My father being a third generation doctor and an Indian parent. <laughs> so I went to my father and I told dad, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to be a musician and I want to do music till the day I die. And I want music to be my profession. And then he looked at me as if I was crazy or something like that. And he said that music is not a profession, music is a hobby. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, what is going to be your profession? And then my father and I and my parents and I, we had a whole lot of fights and arguments and a lot of drama at home for a few months. And then finally, I made a compromise with my father. And I, uh, the compromise was this, that I would finish off a degree in dental surgery, that is a BDS degree. And once I get that BDS degree, 
he's never going to question me again for the rest of my life. My life is my own and I can do whatever I want for the rest of my life. So that's exactly what I did. I went to five years of college. I went to five years of dental college. And uh, at the end of uh, five years, I did not know anything about dentistry, but I got a degree. <laughs> and so I got the degree and then I very ceremoniously went to my father and I gave him uh, the degree certificate and I told him, this is for you. Uh, dentistry is a very noble profession and I have tremendous respect for dentists and the profession itself, but this is not for me. I want to be a musician. And by that time, during my dental college itself, I would go to college from 9 to 5, and from 5 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning, I would be at some sort of a studio. And my musical career had already started thriving, so my father already had the confidence that I would be successful in music. So that was the end of it. And then after that, instead of doing music only from 5 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning, I was doing music for every single waking minute, uh, uh, awake minute of my life and uh, became a full-time musician after that. And as they say, there was no looking back. Now, when I started my music profession, uh, I started off doing commercials for television and radio. You know, the advertisements that you listen to on television and radio, uh, I started composing music for that. And in a short span of 13 years, I made 3,500 commercials. I was very successful doing that. I would wake up in the morning at about 7 o'clock, get a brief on a commercial to make an ad, uh, like, you know, from India. And then I would make that ad from 7 o'clock to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon is when I would deliver it. And then at 2 o'clock, I would get a call from a client in Europe. And then I would finish off their commercial by about, let's say, 12 o'clock midnight. And then at 12 o'clock, I would start working on a commercial, maybe from a client in America. So I started working with every single client possible. I was doing music for Google, for Microsoft, for Levi's, for Lee, for uh, Airtel, Vodafone, Lufthansa, Air India, basically every single brand and their competitor for every part of the world, I was basically creating music for them. And then after doing this for 13 years, it sort of struck me that these big brands have understood the power of music. They've understood the power of music so much so that they're ready to spend a few thousand dollars on me to actually create a piece of music for them to sell something. Because these brands are always trying to sell something. So they are ready to pay a few thousand dollars to me to actually create a piece of music so that they can sell their product. And not only that, they're ready to spend a few million dollars to actually air this music on television and radio. So they have understood that music is a really powerful language, not just for communicating a message, in this case, a message of sales, because they're selling something. But not only that, but also for retaining that message deep in the head of a listener. Like, for example, the, the jingles that you've heard during our childhood are jingles that you'll never forget. You know, the songs that you learn during our childhood are songs that you'll never forget. And if there are any morals in those songs, then those morals will stick with you forever and they will pretty much dictate your life forever. So that is when I realized that I, being a musician, have not harnessed the power of music the way that I want to. I'm a strong environmentalist. I believe in positive social impact and I work towards that. Why is my music not reflecting that? And then that is when I made a very strong decision that I'm going to stop all forms of commercial music like a dead stop. I'm going to stop all forms of commercial music and the only kind of music that I'm going to make is about a positive social impact, about the environment. Every single piece of music that comes out of my head, comes off my fingers, comes off my studio, is going to be about in my own tiny, small capacity to make this world a better place for everyone and everything. And that is what started off my next journey when it came to music. Then, going on this journey, I uh, met a South African flute player, a gentleman called Wouter Kellerman. I was a huge fan of his music. It turns out he also was a huge fan of my music. We met in Los Angeles and we were discussing with each other, how do we collaborate with each other? How do we make music together? And then it turns out that he had, I mean, a huge coincidence comes out in our conversation. And what was that coincidence? It was that he had just finished making a piece of music on his father of the nation, that is Nelson Mandela. And I had just finished making a piece of music on my father of the nation, that is Mahatma Gandhi. 
And then we realized there's a whole lot of cross-pollination over here because as we all know, Mahatma Gandhi spent his formative years in South Africa, so he had a lot of South Africanness in him. And then Nelson Mandela was heavily inspired by the non-violence movement by Mahatma Gandhi, so he had a lot of Indianness in him. So we decided, okay, this is how we're going to work with each other. I'm going to send you my Indian music, you add some South Africanness to it, and you send me your South African music and I'll add some Indianness to it. And then we ended up traveling around the world, we collaborated with over 150 musicians, we became the best of friends during that time, we released the album, the album was a hugely successful album, the album was number one on the US Billboard charts, it was the highest selling uh, instrumental album for the year 2014, won a lot of awards and that ended up with us winning the Grammy Award in 2015. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so that was my first Grammy Award. And after winning the Grammy Award, the next step was that uh, our Honorable Prime Minister, Narendra Modi ji, he had invited me for a meeting at his, uh, uh, at his office. Uh, you know, and I was told that it's going to be a photo op, it's going to be a quick five minute photo op, so be prepared for it. So I went for the meeting, I was hugely honored to be invited for this particular meeting. And then we ended up speaking about the environment because Prime Minister Modi that year, in a few months, was going to be going for the Paris Climate Change Conference, that is the COP21. So for those of you who have forgotten what the COP21 was, it's basically the biggest ever conference of nations in the history of humankind. Uh, 195 presidents and prime ministers got together in Paris to try to come up with a resolution, to try to come up with a deal which uh, 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 to, to reduce our carbon footprint and to make this world a better place for our future generations. Very inspiring uh, uh, you know, conference. But anyway, so Prime Minister Modi was going to be visiting that conference and we were talking about the environment, we were talking about his thoughts about nature. And then that is when we looked at each other and we decided that, all right, you know, I'll make an album on climate change involve as many musicians around the world and he will release that album while he's delivering the keynote speech at the COP21. So that's exactly what I did. I made another album called Shanti Samsara, World Music for Environmental Consciousness. I collaborated on that album with 500 musicians from 40 countries. And uh, basically everywhere in the world, whether it was Azerbaijan or Turkey or uh, of course India, USA, Australia, China, Taiwan, uh, uh, Korea, uh, basically every corner of the globe, wherever I could find a musician that felt as strongly as me about climate action, about the environment, about celebrating nature, I collaborated with them. I made the album, I uh, showcased the album to Prime Minister Modi, he listened to the album, loved it, and then he launched it at the Paris Climate Change uh, Conference in Paris at the COP21. And that album became hugely successful after that, and I performed that album in more than, I think, uh, uh, more than I think right now 35 countries. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to play a short video to showcase uh, the making of that album and what that album is all about. So you can play the video one. Thank you to Ricky K for supporting a better, safer, more prosperous future. Ricky Cage to inspire. I have to take this opportunity to say thank you to Ricky Cage. Ricky has been inspiring and is one of our champions. My brother Ricky, I'm really proud of you as, as always. And the Grammy goes to Winds of Sam Sarah. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Recording Academy. Asatoma Satgamaya Om Shanti 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 Om. Thank you. And the Grammy goes to Stuart Copeland and Ricky. In India, we've got a saying called as Vasudhaiva Kutubakam, which literally means the world is one family. Live in peace with all entities on this planet, whether it is the animals, the wildlife, the forest. Climate change is absolutely real. Climate change is human-induced, and our actions are affecting countries on the other side of the world. Thank you so much. So now, 
as I mentioned, the album was launched at the Paris Climate Change Conference. Now, what happens at the Paris Climate Change Conference is that you have one large plenary hall. And in that large plenary hall, every single world leader from all the 195 countries present goes up on stage and gives a short presentation. The presentation is usually between about 10 or 15 minutes each, uh, each country gets over a course of about 10 days. So while I was watching these world leaders, one world leader who absolutely caught my attention was President Anote Tong of the island nation of Kiribati, the Pacific island nation of Kiribati. Now, to be honest, I hadn't even heard about this country when he went up on stage. So he went up on stage, President Anote Tong of Kiribati, and he gave the shortest presentation. He spoke for just 30 seconds. He went up on stage, and he just said this, that all you 195 countries present over here, please pass a resolution that ensures that my people of Kiribati stay above the water. And that was such a powerful statement. And I started reading about Kiribati. And I realized that Kiribati is an island nation in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the South Pacific, 21 inhabited islands. And they are predicted to be the first country in the world that's going to go completely underwater due to climate change. And as of now, if we go on as we are going on right now, the world, the planet goes on as we are going on, Within our lifetime, they're going to be completely underwater. The tallest point in any of the islands is going to be completely underwater during our lifetime. So basically, we're going to have to redo our maps and our globes. Because the part where Kiribati is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we're going to have to paint that part blue. Because they're just going to disappear from the face of the Earth. So I had to see this for myself. I had to understand what is going on. So I went to Kiribati. I spent about uh, three weeks over there spent a lot of time with their president, spent a lot of time with their people, uh, spent a lot of time discussing with them, fell in love with their culture, fell in love with their traditions. And I realized that Kiribati is a country that lives within nature. They do not have any carbon emissions. They do not have any carbon footprint. They do not have any industrialization, nothing. But they are going to be the first country that goes underwater because they are low-lying uh, islands. Now, excuse me. Can you? Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So, they are, because they're low-lying islands, so they're going to be the first to go underwater. Now, if all of our countries, that is developing nations and developed nations, if we could build domes around our borders, and we could keep our carbon emissions within our own borders and our pollution within our own borders, then countries like Kiribati have nothing to worry about. But then the problem is this, that it's just one atmosphere and a really thin atmosphere. And of course, as all of us know, we all know the drill that our pollution goes up into the atmosphere, our carbon emissions from different parts of the world, from developing nations and developed, na developed nations goes up into the atmosphere. The carbon uh, content of the atmosphere becomes really large. Global temperatures rise, polar ice caps melt, ocean levels rise. And since these are low-lying islands, they are suffering the consequences of our actions. So President Onote Tong, he told me something that was really important which stuck in my head. He said that we as Kiribati as a nation, we are going to fall. We are definitely going to fall. And because we are going to fall, because we are on the front line of climate change, because we are low-lying islands. And when we fall, that front line is going to keep moving back and receding till those countries and those people who felt that they would never be affected by climate change will be affected. And that is the reality of the situation. So being a musician, I made some music with President Anote Tong, made some music with their people, made some music with their uh, with a lot of their cultural influences, with their musicians. And I'm going to play you that song. So this song is called uh, Song for Kiribati. The science is very clear about climate change. Within this century, our entire nation will be underwater. As in some countries, you have a cyclone, a hurricane. Over time, the land remains there. The water recedes. In our case, it does not. It's a disaster that doesn't go away. Our reality is that uh, we have communities who already have to relocate, left their villages. We have communities which are on the verge of doing the same thing. For us, climate change is not something that's likely to happen in the future. It is happening. We are facing it.
Though we may have forgotten, her song is still sung. No need to steal when she freely. When she only knows our situation as those countries on the front line because when we fall there'll be another front line and that front line will keep moving back until those countries and those people who believe uh, they will not be affected will eventually be affected and that is the reality we are facing. <laughs> I think as human beings, we are being challenged. Should we do something about it? And I believe, yes, everybody has the responsibility to do it. So as President Anote Tong said, that, uh, that, in, that all of us know, you know, you have a cyclone, you have a hurricane, you have a natural disaster, the water enters your home, but then eventually it recedes. But climate change is such a disaster where the water enters your home and then it just keeps coming in, it just keeps coming in till the time your home becomes part of the ocean bed. And you know, and that is exactly what is happening in Kiribati right now. So all those Kiribati children that you saw in that video, if you can only imagine that these children will not have the opportunity to grow up in their own country. Because very soon, they're going to become refugees of a new kind. And that is known as climate refugees. So, we may or may not be able to do anything about Kiribati's future, the way things are going, but we can use Kiribati as such an important example to showcase that climate change is not some vague phenomenon that may or may not happen in the future. Climate change is absolutely real, climate change is human-induced, and our actions sitting down here are having disastrous consequences on people on the other side of the world, and there are current victims of climate change. Anyway, so moving on, now, as you saw in the previous AV, I mean, I love talking about this particular phrase. Now, let's, let's uh, throw it out to the audience. Uh, there is a Sanskrit phrase which literally means the world is one family. Okay, so I'm going to count to three and I want everybody to shout out that phrase which literally means the world is one family. Are you ready? One, two, three. Fantastic. Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So when we talk about Vasudeva Kutubakam, when we talk about the world is one family, when we talk about coexistence, the only thing that comes to our mind nowadays is basically living in peace with Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, uh, Parsis, uh, basically different parts of the human species. Because somewhere along our journey of being humans, we've completely forgotten that we are not the only species on this planet. You know, we are just one among millions and millions of species on this planet. And if you look at the ancient texts, Vasudeva Kutumbakam and coexistence in our culture, but let's leave aside our culture, in any culture, any ancient culture, anywhere in the world, coexistence has always meant living in absolute peace and absolute harmony with every single entity on this planet, whether that entity is living or non-living. So that is what coexistence is, which means that we have to live in peace and harmony between all of us human beings itself, which of course we are not doing a very good job of, but we have to live in peace and harmony between all of us human beings, also among the forests, the wildlife and the animals, but not just that, we also have to live in peace and harmony and we have to widen the circle, we also have to live in peace and harmony with the air we breathe, with the land we walk on, with the water we drink and basically the elements of nature. So I'm really proud that we as Indians, we have lived in coexistence with our forests and wildlife for the longest period of time. Better than any other country in the world, I can easily say that. You know, we have lived in coexistence with the forests and wildlife for the longest period of time. We revere our forests, we pray to our forests and our wildlife. And emblematic of that reverence is one particular animal, that is the elephant. 
Who over here loves the elephant? Every single person, except the people with cameras. <laughs> so, so the elephant is emblematic of our reverence to the forest and wildlife. The elephant is emblematic of our worship of the forest and wildlife. But, and there's always a but over here, but with growing human greed, with growing human population, with growing human need, what is happening is that, as all of us know, we've got human and elephant conflict, which is pretty much a warlike situation between humans and elephants. And human and elephant conflict has become so severe that uh, it has overtaken poaching as being the number one cause of mortality for the Asiatic elephant now. Now, when we, when human and elephant conflict, I mean, I do not have to talk much about it, but it's like, as I said, it's a warlike situation between humans and elephants, especially human beings who are living in the fringe areas of forests. Now, when such a conflict happens and there is loss of life or loss of property on the human side, then our, our authorities have to make the very, very, very painful decision to sometimes capture these elephants and to relocate them. Now, this capturing and relocation it is a very humane solution, simply because you're not actually shooting down the elephant, which we anyway cannot do and should not do in India. But the thing is that this capturing and relocation process itself, it seems very humane, and it is humane, actually. But it is extremely excruciating, extremely painful, not just for the elephants, but for all the humans involved, especially for our forest department. In fact, I believe that, and I've met because I'm a goodwill ambassador with the United Nations, I've met forest departments of pretty much every country in the world. And I honestly, from the heart, I always believe that our Indian forest department is the best forest department, best foresters anywhere in the world. Uh, the most passionate, the best at their job. And in fact, if I have to talk about an anecdote, if you talk to a, and you all must have noticed, if you talk to a forest officer about anything, like let's say a Ferrari car, you start speaking to them about it. The conversation can continue for a maximum of five minutes before they start moving towards talking about conservation in the forest. That is how obsessed every single forest officer is with our forests, and that's why I absolutely love that department. But they have to make the painful decision to actually capture and relocate these elephants, which begs to ask the question that why can't we just live and let live? Why can't we coexist? So my next song, and I'll explain about it after I play the song, my next song is called Kudrat, and here we go.
ಮಂಡಲಾಯ ಅನಂತಾಯ ನಾಗರಾಜಾಯ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಮಣಿ ಭ್ರಾತ್ಪಣ ಸಹಸ್ರ ವಿಧುತ ವಿಶ್ವ So I wanted to quickly talk a little bit about cause and effect and how uh, let me tell you this uh, story and then you can derive whatever you want out of it. So do you remember that there was this incident that happened in Kerala in 2020 where there was this elephant who wandered from the forest into a farmland and then ate a pineapple fruit and the pineapple fruit had explosives in it and then she Basically, she lost a lot of her mouth in that uh, while eating the fruit. And then she was dying. And she went on this fatal walk all the way to a lake. And then she walked right into the middle of the lake and she stood over there. And she died while she was standing. And uh, that image became extremely powerful. And it was spread all over the world, from BBC to CNN to New York Times. Everybody in the world covered that particular image of this beautiful pregnant elephant dead and standing right in the middle of a lake. So. The immediate reaction, what was the immediate reaction after that? The immediate reaction was that, you know, that farmer needs to be punished immediately. That farmer needs to be hanged upside down. That farmer needs to be killed. And the farmer needs to be punished. What the farmer did was extremely wrong and a very severe punishment needs to be given to that farmer. But if we start trying to look inwards, we start trying to look inwards and look at cause and effect, then we can see a completely different perspective. Because we as city dwellers all over the world, not just in India, but all over the world, we are so inconvenienced when we do not have electricity for five minutes. You know, we are so inconvenienced. When the new iPhone comes out and it's out of stock, we're like, why can't they make more iPhones? You know, why can't they make more of these phones? Or when the new OnePlus phone comes out or a new gadget comes out, we're like, why can't they make more of them? Why can't we, uh, I mean, why do we have to wait for these phones? Or a new car comes out, why do we have a waiting period of six months? Why can't they just manufacture more cars and give it to us tomorrow? Now, if you think about it, where is all that coal coming from for electricity? Where is all that iron ore coming from? Where is all that silica coming from? Where is all that manganese, nickel, lithium coming from? It's coming from digging up those forests. You know, and what we are doing is that we are degrading, because of our consumption patterns, we are degrading the forests. We are, we are bifurcating the forests because of our transportation needs. We are, uh, we are digging up the forests, and because of this, the forest habitats are no longer good for the elephants, are not, no longer conducive for them to find their food. And because of this, they have to wander out of the forest. Once they wander out of the forest, they're going to go into a neighboring farm, and they're going to probably pick a fruit or two, or they're going to destroy crops. Now, and the poor farmer, he or she, has to make the really, really painful decision uh, to actually protect his or her family and uh, his or her livelihoods. And they have to do this ridiculous thing, absolutely ridiculous and criminal thing, to actually put explosives in a fruit to protect his or her livelihoods and to protect his or her family. So it becomes really important for us to start looking inwards and even through the education system to get everybody to understand that you know, there is a cause and effect and we should not be quick to blame. Now with all the problems that we face on our planet, and there are so many problems, you know, there is, we've spoken about a lot of them, there is climate change, there is species extinction, there is deforestation, there is uh, loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity, air pollution, plastics pollution, so many social issues that we have that are all interlinked with all these environmental issues like gender inequality, water, sanitation, uh, poverty, hunger, all over the world. The biggest threat to our species as the human species, the biggest threat to our planet is the constant thought that we have that somebody else will make a difference. You know, we are always waiting for governments to make a difference, for intergovernmental bodies, for NGOs, for uh, leaders, uh, for politicians. We are waiting for all of them to make a difference when the truth is that the only way we can bring about meaningful change is if we bring about changes within our own lives. 
You know, everybody talks about changing the world, but very rarely do people talk about changing themselves. And that's not because we are some sort of evil people or we are bad people. It's just because we have not empowered ourselves to believe that the small, tiny, incremental changes that we make within our own lives can actually make a difference. Because we are like, if I stop single-use plastics, and I'm very happy there are no plastic bottles on stage, a big round of applause for that. <laughs> so now, if, the thought is always that if I stop using plastic, uh, single-use plastic, then what difference is it going to make? Or if I start using public transportation, what difference will it make? Or you know, if I reduce my dependence on fossil fuels or whatever, what difference is it going to make? But the thing is that these incremental changes is what brings about change. And that is what we need to concentrate on. We need to empower everybody around us to believe, and ourselves first of all, to believe that the small, tiny, incremental changes that we can make within our own tiny capacities actually can make a huge difference. Now, how do we do that? How do we encourage everybody? Now, we can make a thousand speeches like I'm doing right now, or we can make, uh, I mean, that we can showcase a ton of scientific data and analytics to people. And even then, that will probably not bring about any change. In my opinion, what is needed is two things. One is, of course, strengthen the education system so that the education system itself talks about climate action and talks about the environment right at a young age so that the conversation on conservation starts at an early age. But also, what is very important is for artists and for musicians like myself to actually interpret these complex ideas and thoughts and simplify it into the emotional language of the arts, and in my case, music, so that it touches the hearts and souls of people. And if you talk to people on an emotional way, that is, and if your communication is powerful enough, that is the only way we can bring about change, and that's the only way you can change behaviors. And I believe that that collaboration between governments and scientists and artists can be a very, very powerful thing. And that's what I've dedicated my life to. So in addition to this, what I've also done is that I have created, as was mentioned in my introduction, I've created the series of songs known as My Earth Songs. Now, My Earth Songs is 27 songs that me and two of my close friends, Dominic de Cruz and Lonnie Park, we've come up with these 27 songs, which are based on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So we've taken these complex ideas and thoughts of the Sustainable Development Goals, because when you read the SDGs, or rather when a common person reads the SDGs, they hear stuff like zero poverty, zero hunger, you know, uh, protect all life on land. And a common person is like, how can I protect all life on land, you know? Or how can I bring about zero poverty or zero hunger? How can I bring education for all? So the idea is to simplify it so that people can bring about everyday actions that can make a difference. And that's exactly what we've done through My Earth Songs. So there are songs which are like nursery rhymes, adolescent rhymes. Uh, they are in, currently used in the ICAC and CBSC textbooks by a few publishers from class one to class eight. Currently, I think we are in about five million textbooks across India in the English versions. We've also got a Hindi version, which we're yet to release. And uh, if anybody needs that, all the songs are completely 100% in public domain. There is no royalties. There is nothing. Anybody can use it for whatever purposes you want without any permission. We've also got Kannada versions. We've got Tamil versions. I'm hoping to do an ODR version uh, soon. So that is the idea. If I get some help from artists uh, over here. I would love to do that and uh, would love to be a part of uh, your textbooks. So like, for example, we've got a song called, which, is, which teaches children what a carbon footprint is. And the song says that I'm going to leave a mark on this planet, but that mark is not going to be a carbon footprint. You know, so that's the kind of things to engage children. We've got a song about bicycling. We've got a song which is about, uh, which, which sort of takes the SDG of, uh, of zero poverty and it's about sharing. We've got a song about uh, no hunger that is uh, a song about not wasting food. You know, so that's the way that we've, you know, we've made it into simple actions. And the feedback that we've gotten from these songs has been tremendous, that almost every school that has adopted these songs has told us that, you know, that the children have demanded that they go single-use plastic-free. There were about four or five schools who wrote to us that they were going to be uh, destroying an empty space to build another building. And it seems that the children protested, and that is why they decided to keep the empty spaces and keep the trees and things like that. So it's been quite good, and I hope to, with your, uh, with your help, I hope to spread this further and wider. And uh, so I'm coming to the end of the talk. So to conclude, I'd like to say that India, as a country, is much more than just humans. Do you agree with me? You can say it loudly. India is much more than humans. So the thing is that India as a country is much more than human beings. If you think about it, we human beings have been on this planet for 300,000 years. That's what it said, for 300,000 years. 
And the forests and wildlife have been on this planet for 300 million years. There are some species which have been here for 300 million years. Where is 300,000 years? That is 3 lakh years. And where is 300 million years? So basically, if you think about it, the true inhabitants of India are the forests and wildlife. So I wanted to make, or rather I made, an instrumental version of a national anthem because I love the composition, I love the melody, and I think it's one of my favorite songs on this planet. So I made an instrumental version of a national anthem. And while making this instrumental version, I decided to dedicate the song to the true inhabitants of India, the true citizens of India. That's what I call them, the true citizens of India. That is the forest and wildlife because they've existed on this land long before any humans have ever set foot on this land. In fact, they define the beauty of our country because our beauty is defined by our forests and our wildlife, our animals. They define our country itself, our nation, our spirituality, and also they define our own sustainability because without this ecological balance that is maintained by our forests and wildlife, we as human beings cannot exist because everybody talks about saving the planet. Everybody talks about saving the world. But the planet will very much flourish without us. Our planet will exist like long after we are extinct. What we are trying to do right now by doing climate action, by being cognizant about all these issues like pollution and all of that stuff is basically saving our own species from extinction. That is exactly what we are doing. So anyway, so if you would please indulge me, let us all rise for the true inhabitants of India. Let us all stand for the true inhabitants of India. Let us all stand for the Indian National Anthem. Thank you so much. Honorable Chief Minister uh, Sri Navin Patnaik has been uh, listening to this lecture. And I'm very grateful for beginning. that. <laughs> uh, now, our Honorable Chief Minister would like to say something. Uh, Mr. Cage, this is the Chief Minister speaking. What you're doing is truly commendable. That is the work that you're doing. Delivering messages to kids through music is innovative and imaginative. Your speech was truly inspiring and we will support you to compose all the songs in the Odia language too. Of course, what you're doing for the environment and saving animals is absolutely crucial. We are trying to do some good in that regard but we'll certainly do more. Thank you. Very grateful to you, sir. Extremely grateful to you. And I'm a huge uh, follower of your work. And uh, uh, I mean, that uh, it just it's very overwhelming to hear you say that. So I'm very grateful to you, sir. <laughs> 